If I sound a little bit like Boris Karloff, it's because I had an allergy attack yesterday and my throat is all kind of raspy, so, I'll, but, uh, so don't be frightened. Uh, and so I'm going to talk about central banking, and uh, there's nothing more fun than a, uh, a lecture on economics on a Sunday morning, uh, especially a nice sunny Sunday morning. And uh, uh, what I'm going to start off with saying is that um, how interesting it was when, when the U.S. government first began bailing out big banks in New York City, uh, the Wall Street Journal ran an article by a business historian named John Steele Gordon blaming the whole mess, the whole recession and, and everything on Thomas Jefferson, the third American president. He called it the baleful influence of Thomas Jefferson and his anti-central bank philosophy. And Jefferson opposed the, the first American central bank. It was called the Bank of the United States. And, uh, and then uh, Forbes magazine, another sort of mouthpiece of the Wall Street elite, ran an article that said, no, it wasn't just Jefferson and his anti-central bank ideas that's the problem. It's Ron Paul, too, uh, because Ron Paul is the contemporary purveyor of these ideas, of these critiques. And both of these articles argue that the real problem is the Fed, the American Central Bank, does not have enough power. And the reason it does not have enough power is that these ideas these, uh, these of opposing the Fed live on. They were created by Thomas Jefferson. And we need to stamp out these critiques of central banking so that the central bank can be even more powerful than it is. Then we will no longer have business cycles. I'm not making this up. Uh, John Steele Gordon uh, recited, you know, the business, the boom and bust of uh, 1819 and 1929, and and he said, and he pretty much said, uh, if only the Fed had more power, this none of this would have happened. And uh, the reason I bring this up is, uh, is that you know there is this ideology of the Fed, which is the Fed is the financier of the American empire. It's not the sole financier, but it always has been the financier of the American empire. And uh, it has its defenders. The defenders of the empire have to defend the Fed. Without, without this sort of financing, it would have been very difficult uh, for, for the American empire to do many of the things it has done over the, over the years. Uh, one book that I read a while back on the history of the American income tax, for example, the author said, uh, thank goodness we got the Fed and the income tax in the year 1913. Otherwise, Americans could not have entered World War I. And I thought, well, you know, happy days are here again. We entered World War I. Wasn't that a wonderful thing? Uh, and so, so I guess the point I want to make here is that um, you know, there's this ideology of the Fed as a necessary institution for economic instability, but I think it's all a myth. It's all, it's all a, a myth. And uh, so my point of departure here is I'm going to invoke uh, another economist like me, the late George Stigler. And uh, George Stigler won the Nobel Prize in Economics sometime in the early 80s. And uh, I can recall when he was brought to the White House by President Reagan after winning the Nobel Prize, uh, he started criticizing Reagan's economic policies. And they didn't actually have one of those canes, but somebody rushed out and dragged him off the stage when, when he was doing that. But one of the things Stigler was known for is he did many studies on the economics of government regulation, the effects of government regulation. And, uh, and, and one of the conclusions of a lot of these studies is that Stigler always used to say, if you want to find out who really benefits from government regulation of any sort, the place to start your investigation is to find out who lobbied for the regulation or the law, if you're talking about a law, who lobbied, who wanted it. And that doesn't prove uh, conclusively the effects of this regulation or law, but it's a pretty good place to start if you want to know. Uh, and so I, uh, I think it's, it's reasonable to assume that if you want to know who benefits or who has always benefited from the Fed, central banking, uh, find out, well, who wanted it in the first place? You know, what was the argument for it? And sometimes you have to sift through all the, all the nonsense and the rhetoric uh, to find this out. But uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the American case of uh, the origins of, uh, of central banking in America to explain, well, just who this institution really serves. And uh, it starts with um, a group of men in America at the early time of the, of the country who uh, really wanted to bring the whole British mercantilist system to America the very system that they had just fought a revolution against, uh, 
uh, the attitude of people like Alexander Hamilton and his fellow uh, nationalists, as they were called, or federalists is what they were called, seems to me to be that it's a bad thing to be on the paying end of an empire where you're just, you're just cannon fodder and taxpayers. But it's a good thing to be the king. So if you're the king, if you're on the side of the tax collector, that's good. And they wanted to bring this system to America. And so uh, uh, how are they going to do this? Uh, uh, Murray Rothbard explained it in his little book called The Mystery of Banking. And I think this is a perfect explanation of why these men wanted this institution. Uh, this is what Rothbard says. He said they, their aim was to reimpose in the new United States a system of mercantilism and big government similar to that in Great Britain against which the colonists had rebelled. The object was to have a strong central government, particularly a strong president or king as chief executive, built up by high taxes and heavy public debt. The strong government was to impose high tariffs to subsidize domestic manufacturers, develop a big navy to open up and subsidize foreign markets for American exports, and launch a massive system of internal public works that roads and canals financed by government. In short, the United States was to have a British system without Great Britain, the same thing. Uh, that's why my, my latest book, Hamilton's Curse, the subtitle is How Jefferson's Arch Enemy Betrayed the American Revolution. Uh, they had just fought a revolution against this, and, and Hamilton's uh, political enemies said this. Yeah, are you crazy? We just fought a revolution against this system. Why would we want to impose it on ourselves? And a, a big mover and shaker in this, a political mover and shaker, was the, a man named Robert Morris, who was uh, one of the financiers of the American Revolution. Uh, he pledged his own personal credit uh, to borrow money to f help finance the revolution, and he was very revered by George Washington and other uh, the American founders. And, uh, but Rothbard called, uh, but he was a, a schemer, uh, and uh, Rothbard calls it uh, the Morris scheme was, quote, to organize and head a central bank to provide cheap credit and expanded money for himself and his allies. The first bank, the very first government bank, was called the Bank of North America, and it was, it was quote, deliberately modeled after the Bank of England. And this bank was given a monopoly and currency issue, but uh, it became so untrustworthy, people didn't uh, trust the currency, the value of the currency, and the currency became so devalued that it was pr uh, privatized uh, eventually. But the nationalists never gave up on their dream of having a bank run by politicians out of the nation's capital that could finance subsidies to them and to open up foreign markets and finance a navy and big government and, and so forth. And so what did they do? They, they, they worked in politics. They got Morris, got his protege, Alexander Hamilton, the job of Treasury Secretary. Now, probably the most famous contemporary biography of Hamilton is one by an author named Ron Chernow. And, and, and he explains how Hamilton got the job of Treasury Secretary. And he explains how Hamilton really knew very little or nothing about finance. Uh, and it, the war was still going on. At the end of the Revolutionary War, uh, Hamilton was thinking, well, what am I going to do after the war? Uh, he, was, he was one of George Washington's aides uh, as a very young man. And so he figured he should contact Robert Morris for a job. Robert Morris was the big money man in America. That's, you know, why not start at the, start at the top? Uh, that's like, you know, a young college senior saying, what should I do? I'll give Bill Gates a call. Uh, see what, what should I do after I get out of school? And so he didn't know anything about economics and finance, but he knew of someone who did. He knew that Senator Timothy Pickering, who would become later become a senator, who was also who was George Washington's adjutant general, he he was known to know something about economics and finance. So he asked Pickering, Timothy Pickering from Massachusetts, to give him some things to read so he could learn something about economics, which he did. So he wrote Robert Morris a 30-page letter essentially saying, Mr. Morris, I agree with everything you say on the subject of economics. I think we need a, a, a central bank run by politicians, we need high tariffs, and we need government subsidies for roads and canals. And, uh, and, and, and he was George Washington's aide, and so this must have been like a gold mine dropping in the lap of Robert Morris. Here's a, a close personal aide to George Washington who was going to become president, contacting him, pretty much saying, I will be your puppet in the, in the nation's capital, which he was. And it was the, the way he got the job was Morris wrote George Washington, 
and recommended him for the job of Treasury Secretary. And according to Chernow in his book, uh, uh, George Washington turned to uh, Hamilton and said, uh, I didn't know you knew anything about finance. We never talked about it. But if Robert Morris wants, wants you in the job, you got the job. So, so he did get the job. And one of the first things Hamilton did uh, is uh, to start lobbying to overthrow the Constitution that Americans had. It was called the Articles of Confederation. Uh, and so the, and the, the U.S. Constitution uh, replaced that. So the, the Americans essentially seceded from their first Constitution. And, uh, but Hamilton, at the Constitutional Convention, where they worked out this Constitution, Hamilton laid out his plan, which was really Morris's plan. It was a permanent president, uh, you could call it a king, who would appoint all the governors of all the states who, had, who would have the power to veto all state legislation. So in other words, there would be a monopoly power in the executive, in the, in the president, who would be more or less a king. And this was always tied to this economic agenda. They wanted to have essentially a dictator who would impose a central bank to finance subsidies to businesses like Morris's businesses, high protective tariffs on, to keep foreign competition out, and a big public debt to fuel the growth of government. Uh, so this it wasn't just power for the sake of power. It was power for the sake of economic aggrandizement of the people in power. Mercantilism. It was the British system. And so, uh, of course, he didn't succeed at that. They only got part of what they wanted in terms of more centralized uh, government. And again, uh, uh, Murray Rothbard uh, explains exactly what was going on here. I'll, I'll quote him again. He said, a critical part of this program was put through in 1791 by their leader, Secretary of the Treasury Alexander Hamilton, a disciple of Robert Morris. Hamilton put through Congress the first bank of the United States modeled after the old Bank of North America, whose longtime president and former partner of Robert Morris, Thomas Willing of Philadelphia, was made president of the new bank. So Morris's business partner was made the president of this, this new bank. And there, there was a, a debate. George Washington asked uh, Jefferson, Thomas Jefferson, and Hamilton to make the case for and against uh, the bank. And uh, Jefferson made his case against it. And this is what still bugs to this day people like uh, John Steele Gordon. And uh, it came down to, uh, for the, the lawyers in the audience might like this. I think it's boring as can be. But it came down to the necessary and proper clause of the U.S. Constitution where uh, 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 you know, the, the government has the right to all the, all the delegated powers of the federal government in the U.S., uh, the necessary and proper clause allows the government to do what's necessary and proper to carry these things out. Hamilton said, well, it's necessary for us to have a central bank. Uh, Je Jefferson said, no, it's just convenient. And he said, we have banks. We don't need a special bank to put the tax dollars in. We have banks. Uh, we don't want a government, a bank run by politicians out of the nation's capital like, like the Bank of England. And uh, Hamilton didn't really win the argument. What happened was... George Washington uh, owned a lot of land in Virginia near where Washington, D.C. is, Mount Vernon, and uh, he had been wanting the nation's capital, Washington, D.C., to extend right up adjacent to his property, but the current plan was that it would be three miles away. And so in return for extending the boundary of Washington, D.C. To, to abut George Washington's property, George Washington signed the legislation creating the Bank of the United States. So it was just old-fashioned uh, uh, pork barrel politics or you know log rolling, whatever you want to call it, that gave us the first, despite all these long-winded uh, papers written by Jefferson, Hamilton, and others, it all came down to politics of, of how we got this bank. And so what did the bank do? Well, uh, I'll, quote, I'll quote Rothbard again. Uh, they, of course, began immediately issuing paper money. Uh, uh, he said, it issued millions of dollars in paper money and demand deposits, pyramiding on top of $2 million in specie. The bank invested heavily in U.S. government debt, the result of the outpouring of credit and paper money by this new bank of the United States was an increase in prices of 72% from 1791 to 1796. So it immediately created huge inflation. And this bank had a 20-year uh, a, uh, charter, so it was to, to end after 20 years, and which it did. It was uh, 
uh, eventually uh, snuffed out. But, uh, and, but to this day, the, the American apologists for central banking, when they study this history and talk about it, uh, most historians that I know of uh, will say things like Jefferson was an agrarian, he didn't understand banks, and he was actually opposed to banking. And so they make him sound like a buffoon. He was, he was, you know, he was an ignorant economic ic buffoon. He, you know, he's opposed to banks in general. Uh, but once again, Rothbard sets it straight, and he wasn't opposed to banks in period. Period. He was he was uh, suspicious of bankers. You know, who wouldn't be in this day and age? Just suspicious of bankers. But uh, but he was he, what he was opposed to was a government-run bank, government-controlled uh, banking, as, as far as that goes. And so, and there were other Americans who were very uh, suspicious of this. Uh, John Taylor was a senator from Virginia. He said, what was it that drove our forefathers to this country? Was it not the ecclesiastical core and perpetual monopolies of England and Scotland? Shall we suffer the same evils in this country? So they saw this as um, a, a threat to the very principles of the American Revolution. Now, the bank was revived. The, the, the Bank of the United States became the second bank of the United States after the, the War of 1812. It, it started up again in 1817. And Murray Rothbard's dissertation, doctoral dissertation at Columbia, many, many years ago, was, in, was on the Panic of 1819. What a coincidence. The bank goes back into business in 1817, and two years later, there, there's a panic. Uh, and, and he makes the case that there was cause and, cause and effect here. And uh, there's a great little book by uh, James J. Kilpatrick, an American journalist called The Sovereign States, that talks about this. And he says... Uh, that the effect of this was the Bank of the United States ran into grave difficulties through mismanagement, speculation, and fraud. Consequently, there was a wave of hostility toward the Bank of the United States that swept the country, and this eventually led to the, the demise of the second Bank of the United States. Not only uh, did a lot of people think it was creating economic instability, uh, and inflation, but political corruption. Uh, the money, a lot of the monies were, were literally used to finance the political campaigns of supporters of the bank and of the whole nationalist agenda and to criticize the opponents like uh, President Andrew Jackson. And uh, s some of the states uh, hated this bank so much. The state of Ohio, for example, when, when two branches of this Bank of the United States, the, the, the precursor of the Fed, opened up in Ohio, they imposed a $50,000 $50, a year tax on each branch, and this was in the 1820s. And so uh, uh, and the, the idea was to tax it out of existence. And the Bank of the United States refused to pay, so the state of Ohio sent armed marshals to the bank with a big chest and, and, they, and they, went, they went into the vaults, collected $100,000, and left. And so they took it. And other states did similar things. There were, uh, in my book, I, I quote the state legislatures in Connecticut and uh, elsewhere in America as, as condemning this bank. Uh, and and it, it ultimately came down to a big confrontation with uh, President Andrew Jackson, who uh, uh, vetoed the legislation that would have rechartered the bank uh, for another 20 years. So the bank sort of faded away in the early 18, 1840s. And so, uh, and so, there, so the good guys won, in, in my opinion, yeah, although they never give up. The bad guys never give up. Uh, another claim that uh, John Steele Gordon made, uh, they're, they're still out there, John Steele Gordon. He said this, uh, it was resurrected during the American Civil War, the central banking was. Uh, the Bank of the United States was not, but there were national currency acts that led to a much greater centralization of the monetary authority in, in the United States. And uh, John Steele Gordon, the man I mentioned at the beginning, he praises this. He says, the Civil War ended monetary chaos. And uh, I also quote some, some pretty well-known uh, economic historians like Jeff Hummel and uh, Richard Timberlake as saying that this period from 1840 to 1862 or 63 was not perfect, but they, make, they both make the case that this was probably the most stable monetary system America ever had in that period. Uh, and, and I think they make a pretty, pretty good case uh, that it was pretty good. Uh, but what about this claim that the Civil War ended monetary chaos? That's, that's what uh, Gordon said in, um, in the Wall Street Journal several months ago. Well, there's a book, a scholarly book, edited by Claudia Golden, who's an economic historian in the United States. She's very well known. Uh, uh, she's a University of Chicago graduate. The book is called Strategic Factors in 19th Century American Economic Growth. 
And they looked at this same, the post-Civil War era central banking regime, and they said it was, uh, quote, characterized by monetary and cyclical instability, four banking panics, frequent stock market crashes, and other financial disturbances, end quote. And that's what Gordon says was uh, an end to monetary chaos. <laughs> and so and it's not exactly right, I don't think. And so... So this is this is sort of the struggle that these uh, these uh, these mercantilists or neo-mercantilists have always wanted a central bank to fund a mercantilist empire, and uh, time and time again, what did it do? It created economic instability, political corruption, uh, and so forth. Uh, but they never gave up. They never gave up. And one of the things I like to do is uh, I have a couple of quotes here to give you an idea of the uh, the sort of the flavor of this debate. Uh, when, when Andrew Jackson, the American president, uh, vetoed the rechartering of the bank, he made a statement. And, uh, and Rothbard points out that you know, Jackson has gone down in history as sort of a, he was from Tennessee, a southern state, and, he's, and a lot of historians portray him as a country bumpkin. Today we would call him a redneck, uh, which maybe he was, I don't know. Maybe if he were alive today, he would probably... Chew, chew lots of tobacco and go to NASCAR races or something like that. But uh, but he wrote some things. He did some good things and some bad things. But this one statement that he or whoever his assistants were who wrote was a very eloquent statement of why he opposed the bank. So I'd like to take a minute to, to read it. So this is President Andrew Jackson on why we don't need a, a central bank. It is to be regarded, regretted that the rich and powerful too often bend the acts of government to their selfish purposes. Distinctions in society will always exist under every just government. Equality of talents, of education, uh, or of wealth cannot be produced by human institutions, but every man is equally entitled to protection by law. But when the laws undertake to add to these natural and just advantages artificial distinctions to grant titles, gratuities, and exclusive privileges to make the rich richer and the potent more powerful, the humble members of society who have neither the time nor the means of securing like favors to themselves, that is, by the, from the government, have a right to complain of the injustice of their government. If government would confine itself to equal protection of the laws, it would be an unqualified blessing. In the act before me, that is, the chartering of the Bank of the United States, there seems to be a wide and unnecessary departure from these just principles. And so that was his statement, of uh, his veto statement. And I dug up, so I, I did a little digging to find out, well, what are some of the historians, the American historians, saying about this statement that Jackson made? And one, one of my favorite uh, historical biographers is a man named Robert Remini. And he says that uh, historians call this statement, quote, beneath contempt. So that's beneath contempt. It's, it's an outrage that he should be condemned for saying such things uh, out there. And uh, so this, this was revived. Central banking become much more centralized in America during the American Civil War in the 1860s. And uh, I'd like you to read to you a, a statement by the famous newspaper man of the time named Horace Greeley of what he saw as the meaning of this resuscitation of central banking. Uh, when they passed the National Currency Acts in the 1860s, he said, the purpose of this major is to institute such a connection between the public credit and the banking interest as shall, on the one hand, give the president virtual control of all the banks in the country, and, on the other, make every stockholder and banknote holder in the land an underwriter, so to speak, of the government bonds, effectively harmonizing the interests of both government and the people, end quote. And uh, a little background on this idea of harmonizing interests of bondholders and the people. That was Hamilton's idea. Uh, the, the reason he gave for a large public debt was that he believed that uh, the bondholders, people who own government bonds, will be mostly the more affluent or wealthy people of the country. They would therefore have an incentive to lobby for and promote higher taxes and bigger government to make sure there was enough money in the Treasury to pay off their bonds. And so Horace Greeley here, many years later, 70-some years later, is saying, we have achieved that with the National Currency Acts. Uh, that, that was his rationale. Uh, a senator, uh, an influential senator of the time, Senator John Sherman, the brother of the famous General Sherman, uh, he said, as a result of this, this uh, the re revival of central banking, 
a powerful national government and an internationally dominant American nation would arise. So that's you know, the American empire, in other words. The New York Times said, um, commented on the Lincoln regime's nationalized banking and said it, it, quote, crystallized a centralization of power such as Hamilton might have eulogized as magnificent. And of course, it did what central banking always does. Uh, it, uh, the, the greenbacks, the currency at the time, depreciated to a value of only 35 cents worth of gold in about a year and a half uh, during, that, during that time. So it created, it, there was a war going on and it created massive inflation uh, during the war. And so, and of course, the final centralization of the money, the money supply came with the Fed in 1913. And so, and ever since then, what have we gotten? Perpetual boom and bust cycles uh, created by the Fed. Uh, most importantly, it adds to what uh, what it costs, some economists call fiscal illusion. Uh, a good example of this is when the Vietnam War was financed largely by the printing of money, which created inflation, price inflation uh, later. Uh, it reduces the perceived cost of war because uh, if, you, if, if Lyndon Johnson were to say, well, we're going to have to impose a tax of $10,000 per family to finance this war in Vietnam, there would have been a lot more protest against that war than, than there already was. But if they can just simply print money, which creates inflation two, three, four years later, uh, well, then that, that sort of eliminates the perceived cost of government, including the government's wars. Uh, debt does the same thing, the public debt financed by money creation. That's in the, it's called fiscal illusion. And then once, once that occurs, once the government creates all this inflation, uh, since most citizens are economically ignorant, it is very easy for the government to go out there and blame it all on capitalism. After all, who's charging all these high prices? It's the capitalists. It's the, it's the business people. And that's exactly what's happening today in America and around the world. The Fed has created this disaster, this depression that we're, that we're now in. And all, every branch of the federal government, it seems, is day in and day out condemning capitalism and free markets as the cause. And this is a very old story. They've always done this. The government has always created these problems and then blamed it on, on, on the free market. Uh, I wrote a short book about it called How Capitalism Saved America some years ago, precisely for this reason that, uh, that Americans have been taught mostly to, to uh, endorse the destruction of the source of their own prosperity uh, in this way. And hopefully uh, people around the rest of the world won't, won't fall for this. But, but that's, that's who stands to benefit, is the beneficiaries of the American empire, uh, the business elites, and certainly the banking elites. And of course, when we saw the US government give a trillion dollars to Wall Street investment bankers, I would think that that should once and for all explain to everyone who the Fed and who the, who the US government really is really working for. Uh, despite all the rhetoric about uh, economic stability and, and, and so forth, that's the rationale for the Fed. Uh, that seems to me that's, that's the, real, the real purpose of it. And my time is about up. Uh, thank you very much.